All right. I'm going to go ahead and call the September Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Uh, again, good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining the Board of Commissioners meeting. We are broadcasting this meeting live on a virtual platform. For your reference, all information shared today is available online at www.nrha.us in the Board of Commissioners section. We will allow public comment near the end of today's agenda, and virtual participants will have an opportunity to raise their hands to comment. They may also use the chat feature to make their comment as well, and I will share those prompt instructions closer to that time. Uh, again, thank you for attending today's meeting. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda, including three presentations and then three closed session items. To my fellow commissioners, welcome back from our August summer re recess. Unfortunately, during that time, we experienced a significant amount of criminal activity within our communities, which has impacted the lives of our residents as well as the lives of our frontline employees. Out of concern, Vice Chair Albert and I met with the executive staff and the frontline staff at Young's Terrace, who, like frontline employees in our other communities, have witnessed traumatic criminal acts uh, in the broad daylight. Uh, we wanted to offer encouragement and sought ways in which the agency could address the increase of significant events within our communities. Uh, Mr. Jackson will speak in more detail about the outcomes of those meetings. Uh, and now I invite your comments, if any, on the minutes from the July 15th board meeting. Any comments? Hearing none, I welcome a motion to approve. So move. A second? Second. Ms. Carnes? Mr. Albert? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benaski? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. <laughs> okay, thank you. Move on now to the executive director's comments. Ron? Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, morning. I just wanted to follow up on an item that Don touched on was uh, our meetings with uh, both Don and Alfonso, as well as uh, we had a follow-up meeting with uh, some of our frontline staff, uh, uh, specifically the staff at, at Young's Terrace. And I wanted to report to you some of the outcomes of the meeting. The first meeting being that uh, the meeting with the executive staff, you know, we were, you know, sitting watching. We would get the emails from the significant events that were occurring, and they were occurring at an alarming number. And, you know, us administrators not really we, you know, first reaction is to, you know, to run the uh, Norfolk police and see what they can do. But, you know, in, in our conversations with Don and Alfonso, we, we, we realized that there was a, a, a role that we could play in terms of being able to provide more support to the community, bring more attention to it, provide opportunities for us to be more visible in the community as well, and when I say community, I'm talking about our, not only our residents, but also our staff, because our staff has uh, witnessed a couple of our properties, our developments, where staff actually in broad daylight have witnessed these criminal uh, activities and, and have been impacted uh, by that as well. And we had to follow up uh, counseling uh, with those impacted staff, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to go over some of the uh, some of the outcomes of, of the meeting, and I'd like to di uh, thank Kim, Donna, and Karen for for leading uh, this effort and working with me on this. Um, in terms of in terms of addressing the safety, sort of the tactical kind of things in our our community as well as the community support, these are a number of things that have come out of come out of our meetings and what we could do to address the crime and safety issues and, and support uh, items within our community. Uh, our community engagement event is planned to be held on Monday, October the 25th in Digstown to address mental health awareness among our youth and young adults. And if you recall, that's where we had the one uh, the, the homicide 
in that community, of one of our youth in that community. So we just wanted to make sure that we had provided support. And I know it's primarily geared toward youth, especially during the summer where there wasn't a lot of really uh, activity that they could be involved with. But we just want to make sure that we are visible, that we're offering support for uh, the youth in those communities, especially in regards to uh, mental health. We also meeting with Centera's foresight program that's a possible alignment with NRHA's uh, care network. Uh, participate in a regional forum with State Attorney General Mark Herring to discuss funding to reduce uh, gun violence with our community. And when we talk to NPD, that's one of the primary sort of drivers of the, I would say, violent incidents is gun violence. And it's just so accessible now, especially within our community, that it really impacted. Uh, just the uh, prevalence of weapons and guns within our community that we're just trying to figure out a way of working with NPD that how we could address that or sort of mitigate or reduce access to that. We know we can't do that ourselves, but at least bring bring awareness to it so that we can work with available resources to be able to reduce the access to guns within our community. Uh, also create a, a network of immediate access to crisis intervention services, especially following significant events. And like I said before, it's not only for our residents, but also for our employees that experience these events. Um, more opportunities for in-person dialogues and meetings. And that's sort of been a challenge all throughout the pandemic. You know, we, uh, for example, it was sort of ironic that we had planned for the uh, National Night Out events, and I think that was the first week of August where we had planned that, but because of the sort of increasing uh, uh, prevalence of the of, of COVID in the community, uh, but also in part because of the because of the amount of uh, criminal activity within the community, that we really couldn't carry on with the National Night Out events, which we saw that as being sort of a kickoff to be able to strategize and address some of the criminal activities that were going on in the community. But fortunately, we had to cancel that, but we're still seeking ways to hold community events in a, in a, in a safe manner, still try to make, you know, let residents and staff know that there are support systems in place to help them through these, uh, uh, any type of uh, crisis that they may experience. Uh, a strategic relocation of security staff within the Calvert and Oakley Forest areas. Uh, staff has been primarily housed within this particular, within this building here, but we thought it would be better for the, if they were out, actually out in the community instead of being here. It's not that they actually were state, stationed here all the time, but we thought that having a permanent presence out in the communities would be helpful as well. Uh, Flexible scheduling of security staff, safety staff to address issues in community in the community after typical work hours. Uh, uh, anticipated execution of third-party armed security contracts to provide roaming controls in all six uh, all six family communities. Upgrade security cameras in Calvert. Also, web-based uh, a web-based uh, camera access, which would allow remote access by NRHA staff as well as uh, Norfolk NPD. Upgrades to web-based function anticipated for all communities. And also enhancement of resident citizen confidential tip line, uh, which we constantly heard that, that even with the availability of, 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 of being able to report crimes and anonymously, residents still felt like that there was a way for them so for it to be publicly known that they reported on particular crimes. So we just we need to figure out a way to make sure that they understand that whatever what the reporting mechanism that they will still remain anonymous, uh, anonymous by uh, <clears throat> reporting any criminal activity because this obviously we can't curtail this unless we have their, uh, their assistance in this. Uh, increased presence of uh, CRO officers in our family communities, in-house data analysis of significant events mapping to show similarities or possible connections.
connection in conjunction with uh, the police. And there's a couple of other things that we're looking at as well, but you know, we realize that we can't remain idle and we can't feel like we're helpless just because we're not, you know, we're, we're not police or security officers, but there's definitely a role that we as administrators and managers can play within our community to help address crime and also be supportive of our community. The second uh, meeting that we had with the uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner Masaccio and Albert, uh, we had a meeting on August the 18th with the Young Terror staff. And that was one of the staff that had been actually been witness to a criminal act in broad daylight. So we wanted to follow up. We know that they were uh, actually after the event that we had to send staff home because they were so traumatized by what what had happened. So the three of us felt that it, just in terms of being encouraging and supportive to the staff, we really wanted to listen to some of their concerns. And so there were uh, we list, or we wrote down the, the the number of questions. There was really some frank discussion that we had honest discussion and if uh, Don and Alfonso wanted to follow up on uh, on that, they're welcome to do that. But we wanted to make sure that we followed up on their questions and that we were able to provide uh, answers to, for example, the first question that was asked was about gunshot, gun violence, where the employees said that they really enjoy what they what they do, but they're having to watch their surroundings all the time when they're out. And this is like I mentioned before, the couple of incidents that happen in broad daylight, they have to even have to be concerned about their safety doing their job in broad daylight. And so what what can be done as far as management in terms of helping them feel a little bit safer as they carry carry on with their job throughout the day? And uh, we are working on addressing those concerns by installing safety features in the community, including cameras and increased harm. Uh, security con uh, through uh, armed security contract uh, patrols. We are also continue continue to work with the Norfolk Police and CRs encouraging encouraging staff to access counseling and supportive services through AAP. Uh, and I'm not going to read all of them, but just a sample. Uh, another question was signage for cars to let police know who they are in case there is an incident occurring in the police. Don't mistake them for being involved. We have some draft magnet signs that we're uh, that we're working up that we could possibly use when responding to after-hour calls. Staff are reminded to contact the duty supervisor immediately if any event occurs within the community. The duty supervisor will also attempt to notify police of their presence in the community. And then just as just the last question, not the last of the questions, but just like I said, it's just a sample. Of the questions just to give you a sense of some of the topics that were brought up by staff. They felt that in the event of an emergency, and it took too long for the executive team to come out and meet with them. And one of the things that 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 I've done is that whenever there's uh, whenever there is a significant event in our community, that either myself or one of the two deputies that we we will be the first ones to respond once we get once we get the all clear to help facilitate any resources that are needed. So that's going to be our policy going forward whenever there's an event that occurs. So those are, and, and like I said, we provided answers. It's just a matter of between Don and Alfonso, how we like to follow up with, with the staff on providing uh, answers to their questions. So that was uh, pretty much it. And I didn't know if you wanted to wait until your comments, your comments to talk about because I have one other item if you wanted to go ahead and finish that. Yeah, no, okay. I, I'll uh, uh, speak on a whole other issue. That's okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to talk about in recognition of the community advocacy and relationship building that is facilitated by daily, daily by our resident-led organizations. The authority would like to invite our tenant management. Councils or TMCs and our advisory councils to be our guests at our next uh, October 16th board meeting, uh, board of commissioners meetings. We will formally acknowledge.
acknowledge our resident leaders during the meeting. The council president will be invited to join the board, will be invited to join us in the boardroom for a special presentation. We will assemble the other executive council members in a remote location in this building and have them view the, the meeting, the board meeting with our from our online platform. Following the board meeting, I will invite uh, uh, the commissioners and uh, select staff to join me for a brief reception on the first floor. More, more details will be made available on the board, uh, to the board members and after the staff prior to the next month's meeting. In addition, we will highlight NRHA staff at the November uh, Board of Commissioner meeting. It is our goal to carve out time in each of our board meetings to spotlight the work and efforts taking place in our community. Great. So that's the, the uh, next month's meeting, we're going to have the TMC and then having a, a, some, some like a reception down at the first floor, and then the following meeting will be highlighted some of the efforts of the staff in our community. Just to get everyone on the, your oh, presentation, it does say the next meeting with, is the 21st of October. That is incorrect. It is the 14th of October. Somewhere along the way, it got to put the 21st, and then we moved it, and then it got moved. So it is the 14th. Okay? That's, that's all. All right. Um, just to follow up on what Ron said, we did have the meeting was very, very interesting to me to see the folks in person and their real concerns. I mean, these weren't just, I'm scared. These were based upon actual events that they had witnessed, uh, that what, once you hear from them, it becomes much more real than just, you know, I saw something happen. So, right. uh, and again, they were very open as to what they thought we could do. Uh, and interestingly enough, there was some back and forth in between even the employees about, no, they shouldn't do that, they should do this. So it's a very uh, ongoing, discussion about what to do if I'm working somewhere and somebody gets shot right in front of me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and again, I think the thing that struck me the most was this was uh, in broad daylight. Right. So it wasn't like at night, it was the middle of the day. Do, yeah, do we have any, were there any insights discovered about the genesis of all this? Was it Temperature related, COVID related, uh, just uh, the uh, the um, movement of gangs, or you know, why all of a sudden did we? It seemed like all of a sudden somebody ratcheted up the game. And interestingly enough, many of the things that you said were things that came up about uh, this is happening because of uh, everybody's been indoors. Now we're out. Uh, I think the one thing that most of the employees agreed upon was there is way too much guns and way too easy access right. <clears throat> to guns themselves. And again, some of them who were uh, more senior <clears throat> related that when they grew up and you had a fight, you went around the corner and you boxed it out and that was it. Now, when you have an issue, it seems that guns are the way to answer that issue. Right. So it was yeah. very interesting uh, to see that they were, but again, I think back to your earlier point that the frustration of why is this happening uh, does seem to have many uh, sort of ways that people think it's, right. it's happening, but the answer is it is happening a lot more. And so that's why trying to work with the police because I think everyone has recognized there is no one right. absolute answer. That we just do this, everything will go away. And uh, so that's why there are continued meetings and continued work with the uh, uh, partners who can have some things along with the counseling, the police, what we can do, mental health. But, but again, I think it's, it's going to be an ongoing issue. Right that uh, we're going to have to pay attention to for what appears to be quite a while. And we did, we did after we had that the meeting with the young care staff, we actually, I think the following week, we had a meeting with the North Police there. Uh, I think it was the deputy assistant chief that we met with and some, some of the uh, officers that were already working on, on the mm -hmm. ground. 
some of the information that they could share with us publicly that they were aware of. So I don't know if that's a, it's a, it's a coincidence that, you know, after the meeting, and I know Karen has been doing a, a number of things as well, that we haven't, it's sort of, we haven't seen the number of events that we have had. I don't know if there's any correlation between us meeting and anything. Mm -hmm. Karen, I think Karen's on the line if she wants to speak uh, to that. Uh, if, Karen, if you could hear, if there's anything else you could add on that end. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good morning, board and, and executive team. Um, as I work closely with the uh, chief's office of the CROs, um, there has been uh, some leniency in the way that they're able to patrol the communities. Um, get, as it got closer to school uh, starting, uh, the CROs were freed up some. Um, I do have to be a realist and understand that um, as significant events occur or other uh, what they call intelligence items throughout the city occur, um, they may get pulled. Uh, but I have stressed the importance of the CROs uh, being in our communities, uh, engaging uh, with our site staff, uh, our managers, and our residents. Uh, within the last two to three weeks, I have seen that, ha seen that, that has increased. Uh, so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, one of the other things uh, that we're continuing to do, and Mr. Jackson alluded to it, is that to make sure that uh, my staff has boots on the ground. Um, we're now in a time that we need to be mingling with the community and especially one-on-one, -on -one, uh, these families that we're trying to balance so we don't have to evict them. Uh, we're trying very much to have safe in-person meetings with them and provide the services or recommend services for those families to stabilize them. Uh, that is very important right now coming up. Uh, school is now back in session. These groups that were separated uh, because of school are now back together. So I'm getting intelligence from uh, Norfolk Public Schools on situations that may spill over into our communities. So I, I think the biggest uh, piece that we could play in this is to make sure that we stay engaged as much as we can, uh, just doing it safely. And I appreciate the board support. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Rose, you had something? Uh, the, the person that was uh, shot in front of the, uh, 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 the administration in Young was that he uh, rested it or he was staying with someone. Um, you know that? Okay, I'm looking um, at my chief, uh, Commissioner Arrington. We had three shootings, uh, actually two over in Young's. Are you referring to the shooting over in off of Brownton Avenue? Yeah, that, that one. Yes, yes, ma'am. That that was not a resident. Um, there, while there was some gang affiliation, um, as the investigators uh, checked more, it was a domestic related incident. It just happened to have some gang affiliation and overtones. Oh. Okay. Other comments? All right. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. We'll now have commissioners' comments. Comments from commissioners? Alfonso? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good morning again. And uh, to uh, reiterate Chairman Masaccio's uh, comments about uh, good to be back together, I share that sentiment with you all. And just in the way of the report that our executive director just gave, I think one of the things, Don, that <clears throat> Uh, well, first of all, I think it's uh, really exceptional for, uh, to hear that, how afraid they really were about some of these things. But then I think the other thing that struck me is I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Jackson, because it seems that they also felt like there were a good deal of uh, participation that put them at risk from some of the tenants. Am I right? There, there were some tenants that contributed to uh, some of the uh, violence there, and it was hard to kind of nail them down. Their, their children, uh, and, and then them standing up for uh, people who didn't live there, but, but uh, kind of claim a privilege that uh, I'm visiting with, you know, Joe Schmuckatelli, and uh, and then they kind of stood up to that. I think uh, there was some.
frustration on their behalf that they were, uh, am I right? Uh, that they were able to express that. Here, here, here are my comments this morning uh, to my colleagues on the board, and I, and I say this because uh, there is such a thing as speaking truth to power, and I think uh, what that means, and what it has always meant to me was uh, speaking clearly, truthfully, uh, to uh, people and institutions of influence, even though it may have some likelihood of reprisal or punishment or uh, something associated like that. So uh, that's the, the covering that my comments come with this morning. And I say that because uh, I come highly discouraged, almost at this point, but I'm more discouraged because uh, nobody has any mandate to uh, do the things that I feel like they ought to do as it relates to the board's role uh, with po uh, policy and governance and that kind of thing. But, but from my perspective, uh, I hold myself to a different standard because uh, I have a perspective that's born out of being the object of a lot of the things that people that we serve uh, experience right now, people that are poor and live in poverty. I've never, ever lived in public housing. Uh, I've never, my family has never been on welfare or gotten food stamps. I don't even think food stamps existed when I was coming up. I really don't. My mother, I, I, you know, if we were to kind of raise her back from the grave, I don't think she even knew how to apply for uh, public assistance. Uh, we were poor. We were below the scratch line. And, uh, and that's how we lived. We, we uh, lived below the scratch line doing the kinds of things that it took to uh, make it day by day. So I have a sensitivity about some of the things that I see our residents go through right now and what they experience. Uh, and I know some of my colleagues don't. And so their understanding of how that impacts people is, 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 is different. And, uh, and I don't hold them uh, to task for that. I understand that all of us have uh, different life experiences. And then all too many instances, that drives that informs, that fuels our response and understanding of things. I am uh, frustrated at how often uh, people who are in positions of power and influence get into these skirmishes with poor people extremely poor people that don't have resources or don't have advocacy. They, they don't have the same resources that people of influence have in order to exact uh, punishment, retribution, change, and all of those kind of things. But we always end up making the poor folk the enemy. And, uh, and I don't understand that. I, I mean, I, I really don't get that. I mean, you know, we have all of the influence on our side, so to speak, when I talk about influence. But somehow, uh, the expectation that we would behave a particular kind of way, or that we would uh, consider uh, people and their status as people deserving of respect, dignity, and uh, and those kind of things, that idea seems to be something that is foreign to a lot of us. Uh, and, and I don't understand that. And it, and it troubles me because, uh, you know, because of we have been given a charge. And uh, in the context of this charge, we have a responsibility to provide a service 
uh, we are afforded resources to to provide their services, and we're expected to do so uh, in a certain way. And and consistent with that, we have to we're held accountable by the funders, aka HUD and the city and those kind of things. We held accountable by the community, aka uh, city leaders, you know, politicians, uh, all those kind of people. And then the residents have a level of accountability. I think they try to exact on us, and we always end up getting in the fight with the weaker vessel, the, the lesser. Uh, entity in that equation, the poor folk that we are serving, and that's where we exact our punishment. I, that troubles me, and uh, and it troubles me because uh, that is the low hanging fruit. That that's the, the the group that doesn't have an advocacy. That's the, the the part of that equation that can't bring punishment back. Uh, and they just kind of have to like it or lump it, just take it or keep it moving. And, and I know that there are some rabble rousers and there are some uh, people who kind of stir things up and, and uh, cause problems by telling lies on and about staff, by misrepresenting facts in various situations, by stealing, by uh, taking things that don't belong to them in community, by uh, misrepresenting their uh, eligibility reports and requirements, saying this person uh, doesn't have this and this person does. I, I understand all of that, uh, but it's, it's one of those things that me personally, I just, and I know that nobody else, the staff doesn't, my other colleagues on the board, you don't have any obligation to take any of that into account. The staff doesn't, our executive director doesn't, nobody has any accountability to take any of that into account. Uh, but I do. And so I'm always tagged as the villain because I do. I understand how the staff feels about me. I know that. Uh, but, but please know this morning that that's the size of the scale that I'm going to be on. Every time we, we meet, that's where you're going to find me. And I'll say this one last thing, Dr. James Cone, uh, very, very, very well-known theologian who uh, kind of advanced the practice of principles of uh, uh, not social justice, but but uh, something akin to that when we uh, talk about our theology. Uh, and he, he gets that from Reinhold Niebuhr, who said, you will always find Christ on the side of the poor. And, and not on the side of the, the affluent. Not on the side of the people with positions of influence. Not on the side of money, but on the side of the poor. And so for me, that's a good side to be on. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm going to conclude my comments by saying uh, to our team, our collective team, to my colleagues here on the board, uh, to all of our executive team who have to carry out these policies and and make things work after we muddle them up real bad. Uh, please know that, you know, I, I guess I will be the enemy until my uh, the last uh, ounce of service I provide is provided uh, because I'm going to constantly find myself on the side of advocating for those who have no uh, representation and influence uh, to. Uh, other comments from the board? 
All right. And one other thing, I want to congratulate uh, Mr. Dillard on his new uh, opportunity. So congratulations, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, being being out of town, what is this new uh, opportunities? Joe, um, I'm now the I got a new position, um, the director of equitable innovation and legislative policy enrichment at the transit council. Joe, I, I couldn't hear for a minute. I'm sorry. Can uh, you don't spend a minute. <laughs> uh, no, Can I'm you just, please repeat your title? Uh, the director of equitable innovation and legislative policy at the Richmond Transit Company. So you know what? Yeah. Everything going on, the workforce is changing, so it's a, it's very favorable to telework moving forward. So I don't, I, I'm moving, but I don't know when. I told Don and uh, Alfonso in the email that when I'm like within 60 days of knowing that I'm going to move, I'll give you guys a heads up so you can start maneuvering how you need to maneuver. But it's not going to be like a, a two week notice. I don't know when I'm moving if I am moving, but right now it's like a two days in office, one week. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But also, no, there's a, a cheer in there for the rest of us. <laughs> really, two brilliant, uh, well, two very bright uh, up and coming stars uh, with Joe and also uh, Ruth uh, Joan Nichols at the food bank. She right. and Lee yeah. and uh, take one of those positions. So that's. Uh, I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. I am too. My work, I don't want to see my work here is done, but it's coming to a close. Yeah. And it's going to be a transfer. Soon, I'll so. see you on one of the stops on Broad Street someday. You <laughs> definitely will. Or if you're ever in Richmond, give me a call. Uh, we have a lot of bars there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> do we have any other uh, comments? If not, we'll go ahead and move on to the agenda. And that is, if I can scroll down, page 15, <clears throat> which now has the uh, finance book. I'm sorry, I guess my finger's not fast enough. Contract report. Is that it? Yeah. No. Is that it? Yep. Monthly contract report. Yeah, finance and administrative operations. Uh, they've got all of those reports. Are there any comments on those reports? Now, just a, a, a question. I see uh, the security uh, uh, three quarters of a million dollars there, and we have police um, at Half million dollars, and then you know, th there is a lot of money going to security. Well, I think it's, one of those is in response to what we've heard is that the people feel that I can feel more comfortable if I see more yeah. uh, policing, whether it's Norfolk police or armed security yeah. guards. That's what we're, that's so we're, we're responding doing. to that particular well, sense that I, would, I, as a resident and an employee, would feel much more comfortable with more visibility uh, so that we're responding to that. Yeah, I think that's a, a basic thing that we should be providing is security for especially our clientele. Yeah. So does the security also include the cameras and the uh, everything like that? Uh, is it, is it, is it, is it mean in that dollar figure or separate? Yeah, I'll be together. I think that's a separate. Uh, uh, Kathy can speak. Yes, that think is separate. They are, they are separate. Yeah, the cameras are a, a separate, separate project yeah. to the security program. Right. Yeah, these would be for boots on the ground. Yeah, and they're armed security that will be going uh, around to the family. Yeah. Okay. Did that answer for you, brother? Okay, this. All right. I, I, I can add that the cameras, Ms. Arrington, are a separate project. It's already ongoing, though, and we're actually in the process of seeking grants for additional cameras right. and funding for that. Okay. As a separate project. Okay. Okay. Great. 
kind of piggyback it on Dick, and I asked like a, I guess an overarching question, kind of that begs to what Alonzo was saying earlier. So you can increase security. My uncle's a police officer, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to record of saying that they don't stop crime, they solve crime. Yes. What are what could we do to help the lives of everyone in that community rather than provide prison style taxes? Prison style taxes is you put more police out there, you put more cameras out there. It doesn't help people get jobs. Young boys are shooting each other over simple simple disagreements. But is it something that we can do with this funding rather than divert the half a million dollars to get more police out there that essentially won't stop a 3 p.m. shooting? Like a, a police officer, I, I'm not just saying, saying off of police, mm -hmm. the crimes that we're witnessing happen at any time. Mm -hmm. Increased police presence helps solve crime. Right. I think that what we're battling with now, based on social media shooting, isn't going to stop crime. Right. So is there any programs or things in place that we have budgeted that right. can more so not just alleviate and protect the community that wants to feel that protection, but also bring along those people that live in the community that he's talking about that are actively involved in some of the, the trouble. Well, we, uh, uh, for example, like today we made, and I think a couple, uh, maybe our last board meeting where we gave a presentation on the, uh, the number of programs, primarily youth-oriented programs where uh, we're seeking funding that we, we normally get from HRV to support some programs for, for youth. Actually, Don has signed it today, and I pass it over to the chair of HRV, Alfonso, like $870,000. So we know that's an important part of it because we, you know, we, we understand the connection between folks in terms of uh, being unemployed or not getting a high school education. And they talk about the that pipeline from people not being able to have sort of a meaningful if it's training or employment and how but that's the segment of the population that usually winds up in criminal enterprises. So we're trying to address that by providing more of those types of programs for our youth uh, so that there's more constructive things they can do as opposed to you know, just not really sort of being aimless. So we are we we do realize that in our community and we're trying to address that. And uh, I would just like to say I know we're we're safety's number one. We're yeah, yeah. People people first. Yeah. But it seems it's, like we're building with the brighter lights, with increased right. policing. It's a prison outside of the prison. Yeah. Yeah, we we're right. just perpetuating and build the same thing. We wouldn't right. you know, if Don has a problem in Willoughby about speeding, Don gets out in the community yeah. and picks up signs and say slow down asshole. <laughs> Don, you don't ask for sixteen more police officers. You, 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 right. just, but well you know, that's one of the things we did hear in some of these meetings is uh, that the folks think that more involvement in the community would uh, be a tool to meet the part you're saying, which is to stop the crime before it starts. Yeah. And so we're yeah. working with uh, the reluctance to, for folks to, be, to become involved. And I think Ron mentioned the anonymous phone tip line, yeah. those kinds of things as a tool. Uh, and you said to, to work on this end of the spectrum, because we already know what happens on this end of the spectrum. Right. And so uh, jokingly say that this issue is not arithmetic. You're not going to add one thing and get the correct answer every time. But uh, we are trying to work with that and uh, get the communities to feel more comfortable uh, bringing forth information. Because that's one of the things we heard is that if, if, if I say something, you know, because we always say, see something, say something. And if I say something, people will know that I'm the one who did that. And then I will become the target. So I think we've got to work on that yeah. particular piece of it to have people feel more comfortable becoming involved. Yes, Rose. Uh, sometimes I think we try to decide a lot of things that we think is the best. I think there should be a survey sent to the community that they are being attacked like this, and they are more they know more what they know they need mm -hmm. than what we know. They might say, well, we might need uh, more lighting. We might need something else. It might, 
might not be this all these millions of dollars sent to the police. It might be something very simple. I sure. think we just need to do a survey and find out what they really need. And that's part of our effort. I know, like I said, you know, with the pandemic, it sort of hampered our effort to be able to, to meet, to have the larger scale meetings. And, but they don't have to have doing, a meeting. I think they just to but, send it out. Yeah. But, but one of the things we are doing is that, and Karen had talked about as well, is we're having like smaller meetings to actually engage them because even doing a survey, you still want to follow up and and just hear from from residents because there's some things you can glean from a survey, but there's things that you really can't you really have to listen to some of the things that's more it's more open ended kind of questions that you could hear that may be a common thing, but those are the kind of things you get from in person. But I agree with you that could that would help. Because well, I lived service. in D, yeah, and helpful. they were yeah. shooting left and right, and yeah. at night you couldn't even sleep. I took sleep to feel too right. sleep, and the gun by still was. I saw police ride through, but sometimes the shooting would be there. They had to try to find out where the shooting was, right. and and it wasn't the presence of the police. It was just that it was things that needed to be done internally. Where, right. like you said, somebody needed if they knew something was going on, they needed to report it. Right. And that's where the problem was. They needed to report it. And then it's got to be a safe way that they can report, report. it. Because, um, mm -hmm. If somebody hear you whispering, uh, so-and-so, because the wall was saying, yeah. uh, and telling, yeah. texting might be better, but you got to remember right. people can uh, infiltrate those texts. And it's just, it's just a, I, if you lived in it, you would know that police yeah. presence are yeah. uh, okay, but not that great. Yeah, because even the, when we had the meeting with the young terrorists, I think that's one of the things that they, one of the one of their questions was, is there a better way for residents to be able to report information, you know, criminal or things that they that could possibly go on in the community? Can they report it anonymously? Because they were hearing that the existing ways, like tip lines and things like they didn't feel Safe even doing yes, those, right. and so right. that's why mm -hmm. one of the one of the our responses is that we're trying to work on an enhanced platform for residents to feel to feel safe. Because even in our meeting with NPD, they talked about they try to encourage people to you know report on these tip lines and mm -hmm. things. But in hearing from the, mm -hmm. our our staff, they said that the residents tell them they don't feel safe even doing that. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Are you guys going to collect data on this? Because I, I will venture out to say something that's just probably opinionated based on okay. culture. I think when you increase police presence 20 years ago, and I'll lean on Fonzo to, to clarify this because I consider him, in my in my culture, an OG. Um, 20 <laughs> years ago, if you increase police presence in our communities, and not just African American communities, there was a leadership there. Now it'd be uh, if it's legal or not, drug lords, that you're making it harder for us to make money, so you need to chill out, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like the way 20 years ago. Right? Now, that structure with the younger shooters doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So where 25 years ago, people that were trying to get money in those neighborhoods were relaxed on the violence because you didn't want increased presence, doesn't exist today because it's not about getting money. It's because, Don, you commented on my Facebook post and said that I was a bust, and no OG or older person out there trying to make a living because they of their circumstances has influence like that anymore. And that's my guess. That's my hypothesis. Okay. So I would ask that we keep yeah. okay. try to track the data on this increased price. Okay. Is it really making an impact? And I will go as far to say I don't think so because based on our culture, the structure of enforced police presence really wasn't because the police were there. It was because you know, you're slowing up or you're making it harder for us to make money in this community. May I uh, follow up on that just uh, briefly? Uh, tell you how on point you are. Uh, 2019, I believe, we had a real proliferation of uh, killings going on from Berkeley to uh, Park Place to, you know, you know, we called a summit with the 
gang leaders at Seminary at the church. We had the two alpha males at Gethsemane uh, to call the truth. And as we talked to them, to say, can we get you to commit now to call the truth to this killing? And you know what the uh, leader said? They looked at each other and they looked at us, told us how much they respected us doing that. Then they said, a lot has happened. So we will give you our word that we will move from here to do everything we can, but a lot has happened, and here's, here's what they are saying. The belief weren't even in the equation they were thinking about. <laughs> you know, it, it's the thing that they had happened between each other, and they had maybe one or two smaller incidents after that, but they were able to get it under control, and uh, I guess for uh, somewhere around six months, they, they tapered it right off. We didn't do the follow-up like we were uh, committing to do, and that was more about church politics, but but uh, it was a major deal, and, and one of the reasons we didn't was because the media heard about what we had done, and they wanted to start coming around, asking, and we didn't want to look like we were exploiting these young men for media purposes. And so we, we just backed away from talking to the media about it and uh, didn't have the follow-up, but you're absolutely right. That's what they respect. When you empower uh, and, and they are able to see people in the community that empower them, they're empowered. You have to lead them toward right decisions. I think, Jerry, you point. really mentioning how things have changed. We're now in a metric society, and I think it's absolutely on our part to say, we're spending this money to get an outcome. Are we getting the outcome that we're spending the money for? Because as just in this little conversation that we've had, you've heard five or six different ways of infecting the overall metric, which is reduction in crime. So I think you're absolutely right that we need to keep an eye on this and look at things like Rose was saying, right. you know, see it, you know, ask it, what do you think ought to happen? kind of thing and, and see if those things we can align with that. So I, I think it's absolutely correct. Sure. Uh, other comments? Okay, then I'll ask Ms. Mosley to come up and talk to us about electronic signatures. Great morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Ms. Carnes, Mr. Jackson. I'm here this morning to present to you the resolution for the electronic signature policy for Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority. And when this policy started, it was at the onset of the pandemic. And at that time, we did not have a policy to obtain elect electronic signatures. And we were in a stay-at-home status. Um, so we started on a policy at that time. HUD did not have guidance for electronic signatures. so. We were kind of winging it and researching and putting a policy together. Um, we got the policy together, and lo and behold, HUD came out with H20-4, which was guidance for electronic signature policy storage and transmission of all electronic documents. Uh, so what I was able to do was to put a document together to obtain electronic signatures for the agency. Everything is included in this policy except public and Indian housing and the home program. Um, HUD did not provide guidance for those two programs, so they're not included and, as a matter of fact, excluded by this policy. Um, HUD provided guidance. And so what we did was put together a policy, and at the end of it, because HUD came out with guidance for storage and transmission, I added that to the policy also. So the policy includes electronic signatures, um, electronic storage, and electronic transmission of documents uh, containing electronic signatures. It also provides guidance on how to um, um, execute those electronic signatures, whether it's through PDF, Adobe, and you can just stamp it, or if you sign it, or if you sign it and scan it. Uh, 
um, those signatures are all acceptable. Outlined in the policy, um, it is very clear what departments and divisions will have to do, however, is if they choose to utilize this electronic signature, um, they create their own procedures to execute documents. Um, so if we're using Adobe PDF or if in the long term we decide to get an electronic um, document management system that will accept these signatures, that procedure will be introduced by a set of procedures per the department. Um, and that's pretty much it. Cut and dry, electronic signatures. We're just hoping to move forward with approval of this resolution. Uh, it is rather lengthy. Yes. So was HUD. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I guess a couple of real basic questions. Is this going to make life easier for A, employees, B, the residents? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, when HUD, our policy when we started did not include um, HCV and um, occupancy for the use of the documents from clients and residents. Um, and when HUD came out with their policy, it did include um, HCV and public housing, and it gave us the opportunity to accept signatures and store documents from clients and residents. And as we continue to telework in this teleworking environment, it also gives the employees an opportunity to continue to do work and transmit <coughs> documents without having wet signatures. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, questions and comments? Thank you. Well, welcome to the new world, I guess, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> now, uh, on page uh, 40, we have the resolution. What do we need to do? Just a motion and a second, sir. All right. Uh, take a second to look at page 40. It talks about the resolution, which basically says, uh, we think this is a good idea. Uh, and so the recommendation is to approve. Yes, sir. So I will, uh, without, if there are no further comments, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. We'll a second? Second. Ms. Carnes? Mr. Albert? Aye. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Mr. Massachusetts? Aye. Thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You do the same. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have several really bad jokes about technology. Yes, I will not. <laughs> I will show my maturity by now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so next we have uh, <clears throat> uh, Scott, I think, is going to talk to us about. Uh, Did you want to talk about the charge off at number four? Well, yes, Donna, tell us about the charge off. <laughs> my favorite. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Donna. That's why I walked down here, I figured there may be some questions. Um, so as you'll see for the right off for the period ending June 30th, the numbers are starting to go back up. We had a year of very low write off because of the eviction moratorium. We are now starting to see families either skip out of the unit or we're able to get possession because they've abandoned the unit. So this quarter, it was at 39823 um, several of these residents owe six or plus more months of rent, so that's why it's high. We've already received the next quarter write-offs for about 30000 so we're about in line with where they were at for this quarter, and I do expect that trend to continue now that the moratorium is set to expire October the 3rd is where we're looking at right now. Yes. I do have some data on the age receivables. I don't know if you want to do that now or wait until I do the uh, quarterly report. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, whatever for you. Okay, I can go ahead and present that, that information. And I have some numbers for you. I thought you would like to hear this morning as far as our delinquency rate. Uh, this is through the end of August. Um, we are actually at $469,000 that is delinquent. Uh, that's 548 families throughout our community. 225 of those families only owe the month 
of August. So we have about 323 families that owe more than one month's rent. Out of that, we have three families that owe more than $10,000. <clears> Two of them have applied for rent relief funding. We're just waiting for that information and that funding to come back. One has been non-responsive, so we'll probably have to take some type of action against that resident. We have 15 families um, that are over 5,000. So technically, if you take the three out that are over 10, we have 12 more families that are between that 5,000 and 10,000 um, mark. Seven of those families have applied for funding. Uh, three are we're working on getting their application in now, and two have been non-responsive. So what we're seeing is most of them are working with us. We're getting application in for funding assistance, and the hope is that we'll get this money in. It's taken a little while. Uh, we've done some applications a while back. We haven't received the funding yet. So that's taken a little bit longer than we hoped, but we are seeing more residents now coming in and working with us to get their application in for their funding. Any questions about any of that information? Just one real quick, Donna, on the clarification on the electronic signature. My understanding is that doesn't apply to uh, the resident, does it? Um, you don't know. Not the mostly oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought it does. It does. It does. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it makes life so, like easier for everybody. Yeah. So over the last. Just not 12 months, we've been reconciling these people that uh, flew under the cover of the uh, uh, eviction. And so, are we now that's over with? Are we seeing people responding and saying, well, let's work on a payment plan? Are you? Uh, yes. So, we have right now four families that have actually signed a term agreement with us. The term agreements we set up that um, we will we want them to, to set up a payment plan and they're applying for funding as well. And so once the funding comes in, we will void out the term agreement if it pays off their entire balance. We are seeing more of that as October 3rd comes up. And as the numbers I shared, we didn't have that many families that have applied the last time that I spoke with you. So we are seeing an increase in that. Sure. that 
um, are not. They they are just point out like saying, I'm not paying you any rent, and when this is expired, do what you have to do. They made the decision then. Right. And we've had, as I mentioned with the items, we've had people abandon their units after multiple months of not paying any rent. So you have a mix. Right now it's looking like we have more that are working with us than we have that don't, which is positive. Um, when the moratorium expires next month, uh, everyone that has a balance that we have not received funding for should be put on a term agreement. And so we will be seeing a lot more of those set up. And then if they just refuse to work with us, we'll have to look at taking that step action. Mm -hmm. well, I think the key is to make sure that I don't want to paint everybody with the brush of those who right. abuse the system. So I want to make sure, <clears throat> make sure that <clears throat> we have those things available for those who were impacted by it, <clears throat> and make sure that we work with them. And then we've got a process for those who thumb their nose at. And, and everyone that um, is on this list, the manager has reached out. I get a report every month what contact has been done with that resident, what efforts have we put forth. So we have all of that for every month since the start. Yeah, and I think a lot of folks share the frustration that, you know, 80 or 90% of the money that was set aside to do that has not been doled out. So uh, if it takes six or three families, is it three families who've been unresponsive for over 5,000? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Or 5, 000, over 5,000 is the way. Um, and I think the one that's over 10,000, that's the largest amount that those, um, has pretty much made the statement that I said that they're okay. not planning. Yeah, not to them, not to them, but for those who are just willingly taking advantage and know they're not going to pay the mm -hmm. responsibility. So mm -hmm. those, those three. Yeah. Well, we have a process for them. Yeah. So, what, again, the key is make sure those who uh, would benefit from the programs, understand them, we help them get that benefit. And for those who don't, there's a process for dealing with Well, they feel discouraged, and this is my ignorance. So if they don't hear back, which is a possibility about the additional funding that's sitting there, and you guys put them on a term, will they still, will they feel discouraged, or will they still know that there's still a possibility that that funding can come, it's just on a later timeline? We'll make sure that that information is shared with them. And the term agreements, we're going to, I think the other concern they may have is paying their rent now and that term agreement amount. We are making sure for each resident that those amounts do not go over 40% of their income, so it's still affordable for them. So there may be very long term agreements because normally we only do a 12 month, but with COVID at the beginning, we said we would extend that time period to make sure that their payments would never exceed the 40% of their income. Thank you. Great. Now, does any of the residents that have arrears, are they eligible for any of that funding that's out there? Because I know at one time it said if you're already receiving assistance, you couldn't, but yes. now that... The new, the, yeah, the last yeah. release of funding is anyone, even if and you're so, receiving assistance for their portion of the rent. Right. So if it was a housing choice voucher participant, not for what we pay as tax yeah, payment, but we, their portion, their they portion would be eligible as well. Right. I know, I think we have been encouraging them to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Don. All uh, right. Uh, I think uh, Scott, come on up and tell us about the new financial statement. Uh, well, this is the well. Since I've been here, this is the first time we're presenting financials, and I know that you know, with the uh, board, of, you know, being a commissioner, uh, various things that roles that you play as being commissioners, you know, just making sure that the housing authority is operating sat operationally satisfactory, which we have been providing reports on that, but in terms of the financial performance of the organization, we haven't been doing that, and that was also brought to light, uh, highlighted in the TAG report. So we've been working and coming up with a format that uh, that we could present to the board on a get the now is it monthly? We're looking at monthly, a monthly basis, so you can get an idea of the financial performance of of the organization, which is really important, especially in light of you know the budget challenges that we're having. So Scott is uh, 
prepared, gotten his team prepared financials for the, for the month of July, and today is just really going to serve as sort of an orientation on right. what's in the report. And we did have the opportunity to present the report. Uh, this to the Budget and Finance Committee as well. And for commissioners on page 45 of your presentation is where the uh, financial highlights and all that start, page 45. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, when we saw this in, a, in the tag report, Mr. Jackson charged us with coming up with a model and a methodology to provide the board with financial reports and financial statements. Uh, this is an industry standard within the public housing industry to provide this information, so it was not a surprise that we saw it in the report. Each agency, if you have access to their board report, there is no set format for doing this. Uh, some agencies look at it biannually, some quarterly, some at a very high level. Uh, in my former life consulting, I worked with one in Atlanta, Georgia, where we spent three hours with the committee every month and we were down to the amount of maintenance materials that were being used at sites at a board level. So I've seen it very high level, I've seen it very detailed. What we wanted to try to do was to get uh, a format here that worked for this board and that, was, that staff was comfortable with to prepare. Mr. Jackson found a very nice package online from the Housing Authority of the City of Tampa, Florida. Uh, when we reviewed that, we found that this was very readable, A. And secondly, the CFO there prepared a, a cover memo to the statement, which almost more importantly than the statements, even in my review, looking at her numbers, it answered all my questions before I could ask them. So the goal we wanted to try and come up with was to prepare a statement that's readable and with the primer that you'll see in the memo, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, shows you how to read them, what it means, as we move forward, but then the memo every month, the intention of the memo is to highlight for you areas within the report to essentially answer your question. Why are the maintenance costs high at sites if you get into that level of detail? Well, if it's a significant variance or a significant item, you'll find it in the memo. So that way we're all, you know, we're all on the same page. What I've given you this morning is our operating system operating projects. So you've got public housing projects, you've got the RAD project, our housing uh, tax credit project, and uh, three of what John used to call the lucky step. You have Merrimack, Oakmont, and this building. Everyone's very interested in this building. So that statement's in there. Uh, I don't want to get into the numbers per se, just to highlight for you how this works and ask for your feedback. Uh, my staff, uh, I want to on the record, give a very, very big shout out to my staff. This was a pretty heavy lift. Um, we have to get our financial statements to HUD unaudited for the end of the fiscal year by August, which left us really, what, Ron, three or four days to try and put this together behind that. Uh, staff did it. Uh, my accounting manager, Ophelia Schuster, is a wizard with Excel, and she was able to take two to three very diverse reports, put them together, and give me a mechanism to get this out in a, in a very simple manner. So we prepared it and uh, we had this time and we will going forward, there will be five members of the staff, depending on what the content is, that will be on the review team. We plan to always have a three or four day build within preparation of these statements for people to look at their individual areas so that they can help me to put the memo together to you to get you the most relevant information. I would point you in the memo to the second page where you will see a section called walkthrough of financial statement. Uh, I'm not going to go through that unless you'd like me to, but as you read through that section, that will tell you, and I referenced everything to the Young Terrace section or statement because it's the last page in the package. I figured the flipping would probably be easier that way. And it will tell you what is in general expense. Because that can be a question you ask right away. Well, what do you have in general expense? So I wanted to put a primer in there so that everybody can see the categories and see what's in individual categories to help you as you as you read and understand the statement. It explains the variances, what's good and what's bad. It explains how to read the bottom line. 
Um, you know, the real point of this is when you go into the year to date, year to date actual, how are we doing? And that's the goal of this, is so that we can see within operating projects, or overhead projects, or anything we determine that we want to look at, uh, we can see how we're doing. And not necessarily how we're doing against that budget, but how we actually do it. And Scott, uh, yes. for folks <clears throat> that actual walkthrough starts on page 46. Right. And it does give you, the, this is what's at the top, this is what's in the middle, this is what's at the bottom. Right. Yeah, it's very good. Below that, you'll see general notes to all the statements. July is the first month because of the way HUD makes us do accruals. July ends up being very light, so the results look very good. But I, so I want to highlight you, you know, to that right away, that that is always a function of July. Uh, and then I gave you notes for each of the individual categories. That will stay within the format. I will leave that primer and walkthrough in the memo monthly as long as you want it to be there. I know it's a page and a half, and it makes it bigger. But until, you know, I guess my goal here is for first off the committee and the full board as we do this, um, as Ron knows, because he's seen the whole thing, I can double the size of your board report with this. And I don't think anybody wants that. Um, but I do want to hear, Scott, we want more here. Scott, we don't think we need that. Uh, in your public housing section, for example, you've got uh, a sheet that shows all of the projects laid up against each other, added up, and then against the aggregate budget for the program. Behind that, there's a statement for every single project, and if you don't want that. So as, as a board, you, you know, that, that feedback will be good for us so that we can present this uh, to you in a format that you like it. Scott, yep. the, the one thing that you did, um, I think you mentioned it in our uh, finance committee meeting the other day, the way that you're showing revenue as being negative is very disconcerting. We can, I, you can reverse that. We so can look, that, yeah, we, we can look at the system produces it that way. Right. So what we will do, and I'll change the primer for the next month, is I will I will uh, have staff work on flipping. Good. So that it all looks that way. I, I agree. Yeah, we, we need to see a, yeah. a, a negative number needs to be a negative number, okay. and a positive number needs to be a positive yep. number. And, we can, we can so we make that change. And then an expense with a positive number is okay. Right. Because all you care about yeah. is the bottom line. Yeah, and that's why I had to explain in the primer why a negative number of 191,000 is a very good thing. Right. Yeah. And that, so that, that's a function of accounting, the credits, the revenue is always a negative number. So it comes out of the system that way. We'll be able to work within the Excel and we can flip all that. And, and, and look, this is, this is, uh, TAG was absolutely on point in this, and I know you've been a big advocate of this, guy. And you have to break it down like this, but we have so many operating that, and really what our concern, what our observation ought to be based on are, are problem childs. So for us to see everyone every month is probably not necessary. What we need to do is see the backup behind your comments. So if you saw, what, what, how many operating budgets we got? 20? 40? 20, yeah, upwards of 40 and above. Okay, 40 and above. Yeah. So if there was eight of them where there was a guy, we got a problem. If we had those along with your comments, I think that could give us sufficient focus, right? So we, we don't get drowned in all the details. Okay, that'd that's, be my comment. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. We we can do that. Um, as I said, we we purposely gave you the operating projects the first time out, right? Uh, because that that's easier to look at than the central office all put together. But that's where the problems budgetarily are is, is within the development side of the central office. And, and, and exactly. And, and so yeah, we'll, we'll find that's a way to work those statements in. Um, maybe I'll go with the summaries on the operating projects going forward. And, right. And we can, again, we developed this, and again, thank you, Ophelia, we developed this to the point where we, we think that Donna's staff can call and say, where am I on project X? And we can go quick, quick and send it. So if, if we wanted to develop it, develop it so that it covered the board level requirement, but we also wanted it to be able to go down to an operating unit level mm -hmm. to where it was like the, the manager don't care for hope he can use this. That's exact. Okay, so that's, so it, it, it is going to be available. Uh, there's a, there's something in the Excel called a splicer that was put in. So we go click, click, and Young Karis comes up. We go click, click, the city tower comes up. Um, it's very easy for us to do. It's very easy to maneuver. We get the blessing on this, then we're going to bring Donna's folks in and start training on it. 
so that they know that when we put it up on the website every month and everybody that, that they can go in and see, you know, I'd really like to see how our trade public housing is doing. They can do it. Mm -hmm. And with a few clicks behind the spreadsheet, they can go to the line of the detail behind it. That's all tied in. So um, it, it's a very, very good product that we can use globally. But we, we did want to get your sign off on how it looks, make a good comment. This makes perfect sense to an accountant, but probably not to anyone else, that the revenues are negative numbers. So we'll flip that. We'll, we'll make sure that there's a, hopefully he's probably listening, probably listening. So there, there'll be a, there'll be a change there, and we'll change that into primer going forward. Okay. Okay. And then Come. I'm going to entertain any question or comment. Comments, um, folks. This, yeah. kind of, this kind of came out of thin air, so we want to make sure it works for everybody. This yeah. Yeah. Program. So, so what? Uh, what I hear you suggesting is that we have a summary, and would we have like the lucky seven summary of, of of the good stuff? But then in your cover letter, you would say take particular notice that you know this one and maybe that one's expanded so we can see what's going on. Yes, and yeah, absolutely. And we also have, as Mr. Benassi pointed out, we've got some budgetary challenge areas, mm -hmm. so we can certainly generate a statement. On this format that highlights those areas mm -hmm. and, and include that and then comment on how we're doing. Okay. Um, furthering that question, talking about trouble areas, um, digs where we have construction going on and all of a sudden there are change orders. How, how are you going to be presenting financials of ongoing capital improvement projects? That's a great question, and that is that's an enhancement that we need to look at. This right now is only operation. All right, we, we, have a, we have a budget model in our chain where we compare the two, mm -hmm. but th this is an operating statement. Okay. So a further change order at Digstown would not show here. Mm -hmm. However, it's in the accounting system. Right. So a statement on the development of Digstown is possible to generate. See, so that's one of those hidden knives that, yeah. mm -hmm. that has been getting us, and I, I was taking interest in the security, the cost of security, and various things like that. Uh, Above my pay scale, you know, I, I'm I'm not um, thinking in those mm -hmm. terms, but they really come back to get you. At that the that is something we can we can now. There, the the accounting of those costs does not match a development budget. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with the development budget that will general conditions, et yeah, cetera, yeah, et cetera. Thirty two. It's, it's all construction and progress as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. But are we or aren't we meeting our expectation or our budget? We can certainly progress on that. Great. That would work that. Other comment, Ken? Yes. This is this is exactly the kind of thing when I was in private industry when I had nine branches work for you had to break it down so you could look at look for all the issues. Right? Yeah. This is great. Thank you. And again, thanks to the staff for yeah. putting this together with a relatively short timeline. Absolutely. Really do appreciate it. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have uh, I guess development. <clears throat> Dr. Clark, or I guess what you call him hot. Mic. Yes. Good morning. What we're hey, doing right. now? Hey, what we're doing now is including that in the uh, in the in the uh, with the other reports and if you have any questions we can answer one of the things I'd mention is because um, with city funding obviously not coming in the way we had hoped the acquisitions are really not going to happen this year I think we do have a little money left for Willoughby so that'll probably be the only neighborhood that you would see unless the city decides to do something you know mid-year like they've done in the past as far as dispositions, of course, they're normally a low this time of year, but as we move to um, October, November, you'll start seeing those again. What we also started including, and you'll see it on the report, are conveyances to the city. Um, these are at no cost, but this is just where the city is gonna take the lead on development and um, these parcels will be uh, transferred off our books. When we know what the development is, we'll note it. In some cases, we don't know. 
And, and so, so, Mike, the, you're talking about this list of Church Street downtown, Fairmont having a new fire station. Yes. So we're conveying the property so they can build a fire station. Yes. We, and, and quite frankly, with the uh, Lafayette Boulevard and Fairmount area, um, we were directed to acquire specific properties uh, years ago, and the, frankly, the fire station was one that they've been trying to do for a number of years, and they've just now, uh, um, they're just now moving forward with it. Gotcha. Other questions, comments for Mike? All right, thank you, Mike. Thank you. I'll ask <clears throat> Ms. Mills to come back up. And the housing operations stuff is on starts on page eighty six. Good morning again. Morning. Um, so I will be presenting an overview of the quarterly report for the housing operations division for the fourth quarter of twenty twenty one, which ended June thirtieth. As Mr. Masaccio said, they start on page eighty six of your packet. Um, you have detailed reports, but I'm going to highlight a few of the um, actions in each of the departments, and then we'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Um, so the first one is the Housing Choice Voucher Program. For this period, again, ending June 30th, we had 3,845 participants in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. We added 30 new landlords to the program during the quarter and conducted a 1750 1,757 housing quality standard inspections. We also received 63 emergency housing vouchers from the Department of HUD. These vouchers are to assist families that are homeless, at risk of homeless, are dealing with some form, form of violence. And we've been working with our partner, our continuum of care partner, to um, get referrals for these uh, vouchers and get these out and issued. Under the Housing Programs Department, you will see the update from the uh, CNI efforts that was from June 30th. You have more updated information that was provided in your packet for an update today. They also compiled and submitted the 2022 annual plan to HUD on June 16th. Um, I believe as of today, we still have not received the approval yet. Um, so we have taken it that it is approved since we've uh, passed the extension date that that's allowed. And then also for the Office of Economic Opportunities, they conducted employment outreach for 11 job opportunities and two training opportunities for contractors. Under the Facilities Management Department, we continue to have a number of leaks in water lines throughout our community. So staff has spent a lot of time correcting those leaks, as well as assisting property management with turning basic units and emptying in units in high water gardens as they are relocated out of those units. In the property management program, uh, we have 3,183 units. Our occupancy rate is 94.60 when you exclude high water gardens and dig town. Our tenant accounts receivable was 5.23 at the end of June. Compared to June of 2020, we were at 1.76. So as I mentioned earlier today, we knew that number was significantly higher. And as far as uh, terminations or evictions for that period, we had 16 at 0.65% compared to the fourth quarter of 2020. We had 50 at 2.04%. Again, much lower. A lot of that related to the eviction moratorium. In the client service department, we were happy to receive $137,500 grant from the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. That is to help us continue our out-of-school out youth program. Um, we also had staff that worked alongside with information technology to upgrade the Wi-Fi infrastructure in all of our mid-rises and family communities. And as of June 20th, the department assisted 14,428 individuals as part of the summer nutrition program. So they were very good. For the Safety and Security Department, um, they worked alongside our Communications Department to roll out the Code Red messaging system. This is to ensure that our staff get alerts whenever there's an emergency situation going on. 
They also work a lot of information technology to install additional security and safety features in our communities. And reviewing the trespass ban during this quarter, they have removed 22 additional individuals from the list. Yeah, it's probably a good time to make that correction on the century. Okay, you got my, my yeah, yeah, you can go ahead and make that. Um, yeah. So <laughs> earlier today, um, when you were discussing safety and security and the contract, um, there was a note about the cost that was listed on that contract sheet. Just wanted to um, make comment that the first one, which said century for the 700, it was 700 and some thousand dollars. That is not in the family community. That is the mid-rise courtesy officer. So many of you know, we have courtesy officers for many years in the mid rises They're unarmed. They're there when we're not there in the evening and on the weekend. So that 700,000 expense is actually the mid rise contract that was just rewarded to a new company. Uh, the $500,000 on that sheet was the contract we have with the police department for the family community. Um, so that is all of the departments under housing operations. We also included in our report a, um, an update from design and construction as relates to the capital fund program. And their work, of course, continues to be out in Big Town and the RAD conversion, also doing a number of property repairs and upgrades in our other public housing communities. Um, the staff, I have the directors and the managers on the line if there's any specific questions. I do want to thank them and their staff for the work over the last quarter. Um, and then when I come back to you next time, we'll be highlighting the series of July through September of 2021. Can I answer any questions that you have, or is there any comments? No questions? No, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, uh, community engagement. Do you have anything uh, from that? No? Okay. No updates from community uh, engagement. Thank you. All righty. Um, any new business? Nothing? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the committee notes, uh, very interesting, uh, which is updates. Uh, there are some that appear to be actually verbatim, uh, which I will now be more cautious uh, in those meetings. <laughs> As you should. As I should. Sister Mary Thomas would be proud. Now. Now. Back now. Um, so we're going to go into closed session if there are no comments on the uh, <clears throat> committee meeting notes. Before then, uh, I'll ask for public comment if there's anyone. Uh, Public comment, virtual participants, if you would like to state your comment, please click on the raise hand icon on your screen and you will be called upon. You can also type a comment into the question box on your screen as well. Ms. Moore, do we have one? We have no callers at this time, but I'm going to check the lobby and then please. come back and check. Thank you. We have no one in the lobby, and we have no callers on the line with our hand raised. All righty, then I will uh, ask Ms. Carnes to talk to us about the closed session. Yes, sir. Resolution convening a closed meeting on September 16, 2021. Be it resolved that the authority will convene in a closed meeting pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended, the Act to discuss the following matters, which are specifically exempted from public disclosure by the code section referred to below. One, person
personnel matters involving the assignment, appointment, promotion, demotion, performance, salaries, or resignation of employees of the authority, as authorized by Section 2.2-3711A1 of the Act, and two, consultation with the authority's legal counsel regarding actual or probable litigation and legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel, as authorized by Section 2.2-3711A7 of the Act. May I please have a motion? So moved. A second. Second. Mr. Albert? Aye. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. All right, then we will do our typical, uh, take a few minutes while we uh, take care of all the technology and everything, reminding you not to discuss any business whatsoever during this time. Do I have to wait for the lady again? The lady's already going. Yep. Okay. All right, folks. Ms. Garns? Yes, sir. Resolution certifying a closed meeting on September 16, 2021. Whereas the authority has convened a closed meeting on this date, pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the 1915 Code of Virginia, as amended, requires a certification by this authority that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, upon due motion duly made and seconded, be it resolved that the authority hereby certifies that to the best of each commissioner's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the authority. May I have a motion? So moved. A second, please. Second. Mr. Albert? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? 
Mr. Dillard? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Chairman Misaccio? Aye. Got a job before any, I'm watching. Any further comments? All right, then I will close the September meeting. Thank you very much. Good, good.